when the room goes quiet on its own, I, I think it's time to start. So I think the room has spoken. <laughs> welcome everyone. It's great to be able to welcome you to this year's Beckley Lecture. My name's David Hardman. I'm the Methodist team leader of the Joint Public Issues team. And uh, it's good to be here with some colleagues from uh, the Joint Public Issues team. Uh, so we have Paul Morrison. And Steve Hucklesby here as well. So we, we would have had Hannah here as well, but unfortunately, even before coming to conference, she fell foul to COVID. So um, she's not with us. Uh, and that's why we also haven't got our fancy new banners that say what JP is. Um, so that's why we've got a plain wall. So we apologize for that. We are gathering online as well as on site. So we welcome those people that are joining us online. And when we get to questions, there'll be a chance for questions from the room and also questions from people who are watching online. If you want to know a little bit more about JPIT, then you can head over to our new website. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's as exciting as it gets tonight. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting as it gets from me tonight. <laughs> um, so quite simply, you just need to put jpit.uk into, into your browser and you'll get to our website and you can learn a lot more about jpit and the team and all the things we're working on at the moment. But tonight is the Beckley Lecture. And uh, it takes place every year. And it's the result of John Henry Beckley, a Wesleyan, a lay Wesleyan Methodist who founded a trust that's been responsible for the lectures since 1926. Ooh, yeah, getting close to the 100th. Um, so the original sort of charter for the Beckley lecture says that the function of the lectureship shall be to set forth the social implications of Christianity and to further the developments of a Christian sociology and the expressions of the Christian attitude in reference to social, industrial, economic, and international subjects. Is that okay, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> we'll cover all of that, will we? Excellent, excellent. So it is a great privilege uh, this evening to be able to welcome Lord Botang. The Right Honourable Lord Paul Botang will bring his political and legal expertise, as well as his own faith, to these questions and to deliver the 2022 Beckley Lecture. Paul has been a member of the House of Lords since 2010, where he has served on the Joint National Security Strategy Committee and is currently on the International Relations and Defence Committee. Paul was MP for Brent South uh, between 1987 and 2005 becoming the UK's first Black Government Minister in 1997 and the first Black Cabinet Minister in 2002, serving in the Departments for Health, Home Office and the Treasury. He's also served as British High Commissioner to South Africa from March 2005 to May 2009. He's a practised as a civil rights lawyer, first as a, so a solicitor and then as a barrister, primarily advocating on social and community cases. He's also an active Methodist and lay preacher and currently chairs the Archbishop's Commission on Racial Justice. Britain, global power or good neighbour? A challenge to the kingdom, quotation, conflict and climate change and the impact on the global south. So please join with me to welcome Paul Boltang. Vice President, sisters and brothers, it's good to be with you here in Telford this evening. And I'm honored to have been asked to give this year's uh, uh, Beckley Lecture. Uh, John Henry Beckley, you heard something about, 
uh, who founded the trust that's responsible for this lecture, uh, gave us and said its function should be uh, to set forth the social implications of Christianity and to further the development of a Christian sociology and the expression of Christian attitude in reference to social, industrial, economic, and international subjects. So no pressure. <laughs> uh, but what I will seek to do in uh, addressing those topics in this lecture under the title Climate Change, Contagion and Conflict, Challenges to the Kingdom, the Ubuntu principle, a way forward, is to examine how the uh, current uh, crisis arising from the existential environmental threat to the environment from global warming, how that crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still very much with us, the Ukraine war, how they represent a, a triple whammy, really, uh, a near perfect storm, undermining both the uh, global governance that the world seeks uh, to rely upon, seeks to engender in terms of the way that it operates, our own systems of national governance, and indeed the delivery of the sustainable development goals, a threat undermining all of those things a threat to peace, justice, and the integrity of creation. Peace, justice, and the integrity of creation. Those values that lie at the heart of God's kingdom. We are required, aren't we, as individuals, as children of God, we are required as Methodists, part of his great church, we are required to respond to those challenges, to read the signs of the times. That's what St. Paul challenges with, doesn't it? Read the signs of the times. We're required to do all of those things. And I would argue that we would do well to fashion a response on the basis of the Ubuntu principle. U-B-U-N-T-U, -U, a Cossack word. A U the Ubuntu principle, which was articulated so effectively in his life and ministry uh, by the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And the principle is summed up in the phrase, we are what we are because of others. We are what we are because of others. It is through the recognition of <coughs> the mutuality of shared responsibilities and obligations, the bonds of obligation and responsibility that bind us all together. It is through recognizing and developing those that we find a way forward based on that common and shared humanity as children of the living God. Now, I should say that in casting my eyes, as one does when given a particular task, over the list of those who've been called to do it before, uh, the list of previous lecturers in preparation for tonight, I was struck not simply by the widely varying 
political and disciplinary backgrounds from which they were drawn. Indeed, the last in 2019, I think it was, was a former parliamentary uh, colleague uh, of mine in the lower house and indeed a, a parliamentary colleague of mine in the, in the upper house, Gillian Shepherd. Uh, who served with such distinction not just as the Secretary of State but as the first woman Treasury Minister. I think that's often <coughs> forgotten amongst her many uh, achievements. So not just the variety of political and disciplinary backgrounds, uh, their eminence, uh, the relevance of the topics uh, they uh, chose and the need to, to live up to the challenge that this represents. But I was struck in going through that list and as you've said, it's a long one, uh, by one in particular, uh, a Dr. William Pack, uh, Secretary of the uh, International uh, Missionary Council, as was. Now, there's no one here present who heard his lecture. I think I can say that with absolute <laughs> confidence, <laughs> although they are a, a number uh, of uh, you who are certainly old enough to remember me wearing an afro uh, and, and flares. I mean, it's like, don't, don't pretend that that wasn't your first uh, uh, image uh, in relation to certainly some of, the, some of you, but I can remember some of you too when you had hair that wasn't gray and, <laughs> and a number of you who did also wear flares. So, you know, don't, don't, feel, don't feel too superior uh, on, on that front. Uh, but, Dr. Patton delivered a, a speech entitled The White Man's Burden. The White Man's Burden. <laughs> now, I don't know whether this was in any sense ironic. I haven't been able, although there must be a record of it somewhere, and I'd like to read it, I haven't been able uh, to uh, source it and to dig it out. But given that it was delivered back in 1939 and echoes a poem by Roger Kipling of the same name, it may not have been ironic. It may have been meant quite literally, the white man's burden. I was strongly tempted but in the event resisted the temptation of calling this lecture, <laughs> partly by way of riposte, the black woman's burden, the black woman's burden, given that the negative economic and developmental effects of climate change, contagion and conflict do fall disproportionately on the peoples of the global south, do fall disproportionately on black and other peoples of color and children and women of color in particular. So I would have been perfectly entitled to have called this lecture, the black woman's burden, but climate change, contagion, conflict, the Ubuntu principle will have to do. But you know, we're about the business, aren't we? As followers of Jesus Christ, we're about the business of easing the burden of all God's children, of all God's children, regardless of race or gender, of class, of sexual orientation, regardless of all those things. We're about the business through the grace and love of God of easing the burden of all God's children. And so it's entirely right, hence the importance of the Ubuntu principle, 
that all those years on from 1939 and the white man's birth, we should be looking to the global south for a theology of liberation. It's right that we should be looking to the global south and the struggle for racial, social and economic justice that the Ubuntu principle represents. We are just what we, we are what we are because of others. It's right that we should be looking to the Ubuntu principle, to the theology of liberation in the global south as we seek to find a way through these times, these troubled and troubling times. Climate change, contagion, conflict. Let's begin by examining the data and what that tells us about the nature of the challenge we face. Now, 2020, was a year where in terms of the climate and the temperature, there was a tie in 2020 as the hottest year ever in terms of climate records. With the record-breaking extreme weather and climate-driven disasters, fires, floods, and hurricanes. The impact of the COVID-9 pandemic is likely and is in reality now already exacerbating the impact of climate-driven challenges and disrupting the efforts to address them. Overwhelming local health systems at a time in which they are already under extreme stress. And the cost of damage and recovery from natural disaster, when compounded with the pandemic, are estimated to be as much as 20% higher than would normally otherwise be the case. So the consequences of climate change and contagion at this time are serious to catastrophic. It's that bad, nothing less. Extreme weather has contributed to conflict and terrorism in fragile states that have led to the displacement of 80 million peoples from their homes. Now these aren't statistics from Oxfam, from Amnesty International, they are statistics from the US State Department. So we are witnessing the highest level of human migration in the history of mankind. According to the World Bank, by 2050, more than 143 million could be driven from their homes by conflict over food and water insecurity and climate-driven natural disasters. And by 2070, almost 20% 20 of the planet could be too hot to be habitable. Now that is not in the most extreme scenario. That is what would happen and will happen if we don't meet our current commitment. And even if we do, we will face continuing rises in the numbers of people driven by conflict and climate change and by all that arises from it uh, to move, to migrate, to leave all they know, to go to a strange land in the hope of a better life. <laughs> Sending people to Rwanda is not going to help that. Relying on a convention 
that is itself the product of a very different time uh, when uh, the world was required to respond to global uh, conflict doesn't look like it's up to the task of managing these levels of migration. <coughs> so we are challenged to think anew. We are challenged to develop systems, processes, by which it is possible for people to move in safety and with dignity. And for that to happen, there needs to be a global debate. There needs to be driven a global consensus in order to create an international regu regulatory system for migration that is fit for purpose. Now, that is no easy task. But it's a task that does require purpose, a sense of purpose, a sense of focus, and it requires the will, the will to drive that conversation. Where is that will today? Where is that will today? Where is there anything other than partiality and expediency in terms of handling the migration crisis. We need to recognize that, but we need to do more than recognize it, don't we? We have as ourselves part of a global family. We have as ourselves part of a global connection in all the places where we find ourselves to work in order to impact on those who are in a position to change policy and to formulate new policy. We have rather than to hold up our hands in horror or go onto our knees in prayer. All those things are legitimate and indeed necessary things. We have also to be prepared to do the heavy lifting that is, in, that is the business of changing policy. And we have to create the safe space within our connection, within our churches, within our communities, to have those conversations, difficult though they are. That's just one aspect of what it is we have to do. We who are Methodists, we who seek to follow in the footsteps of the fishermen. I want to turn to one other area before moving on, and that is food and water security at this time of contagion and climate change and conflict. Because of the 124 million people who face crisis levels of acute food security before both the pandemic and the Ukraine conflict, 70% of those were in that position directly as a result of clim climatic shocks and extremes of weather, which affected not just 124 million of our own species, but also have brought a million species to the brink of extinction. A million species to the brink of extinction, impacting crop growth, fisheries, and livestock. Water uh, temperatures uh, and uh, warmer uh, climatic conditions and the changes in all of those could expose as many as a billion people to deadly infectious diseases such as Zika, dengue fever, chikungunya, and not just in the global south, because already in the US, disease uh, from mosquitoes, uh, ticks, 
and fleas. Diseases caused by those three uh, 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 insects have more than tripled. That's in the United States. That's in a developed economy. We are all in this together. Our response has to reflect a shared and common purpose. The strength after all of the SDGs is that they offer hope, they offer something to everybody. They're not us doing good for them. They are about us together in the same boat, rising with the waters. Us in the same boat, seeking to work together to bail us out. We are what we are because of others. But this impact on disease and levels of disease and epidemiology could lead to an additional 250 million people dying each year between 2030 and 2050 from diseases including uh, malaria. And already the Red Cross estimates that more than 50 million people around the world have been affected by a combination of COVID and climate change in terms of the impact of disease. So let me turn to the impact on economic development of climate change alone, even before we include COVID and the Ukraine. Uh, the World Bank uh, estimated on the low impact scenario of climate change, if we all do what we're pledged to do, and it works, between three and 16 million people falling into poverty by 2030, on the high impact figures, between 35 million and 122 million. A Stanford study has found uh, that climate change uh, has increased uh, inequality between developed and developing nations by 25% since 1960. And that trend in inequality continues. Even before you factor in the pandemic, inequality grew within nations to so that uh, uh, some 71% of the world's uh, population uh, has been affected by an increase in inequality within their own nations. And that's not just them, it's us. And we all know that, don't we, with the evidence of our own eyes, with the nature of our own service in the churches which we attend and in the communities in which we live. You see that in the proliferation of food banks. You see that in the proliferation of clothing banks for people who otherwise would not have access to warm clothes. We are what we are because of others. We are in this together and we have to find a way of getting out of it together. And it is our faith, it is our connection that provides for each of us and for the institutions of which we are a part, a pathway to building those relationships. You know, even as 120 million people are pushed into extreme poverty. Uh, global millionaire wealth grew by $4.4 trillion between 2020 and 2022 alone. And if you take the last two years, two, the richest two uh, deciles have recovered half their previous year's losses. This is even as... <laughs> the wealth of the wealthiest was increasing in the way that I have described, but the poorest two deciles have in fact gone on 
to lose a further 5% of their income. So uh, the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting, uh, are getting richer. And now the war in Ukraine has compounded an already dire situation. Uh, you know, we are facing uh, the greatest cost of living crisis in a generation. That's what uh, the UN uh, Global Crisis Response Group published only on the 8th, a report published only on the 8th of June tells us. 60% uh, of workers globally have lower real incomes. Globally, 60% of workers have lower real incomes. 60% of the poorest countries are either in debt distress or at a risk of it. Uh, developing uh, countries are missing $1.2 trillion a year to fill their social protection gap. And, and $4.3 trillion are needed per year in additional resource if we are to meet the sustainable development goals. That is the scale of the challenge. That's what the data tells us. So in the face of that data, business as usual clearly isn't an option. Business as usual is not going to provide the answer. We need a global conversation. The Methodist connection ideally placed to be part of that and a coordinated public policy response that mobilizes effective communications between peoples and is implemented through improved and reformed institutions, both multilateral and sovereign, regional, national, and local. Our own institutions, domestic and global, look increasingly threadbare and unfit for purpose. The scale of the challenge is aggravated by the military threats that exist in Europe and beyond. The scale of the crisis is greater than in 2008, and that was, that was a crisis. And we are faced too by a global crisis of confidence in leadership, driven not just by the perceived or actual personal inadequacies of those in office globally, but by the poisonous and polarizing echo chamber effect of social media and the World Wide Web. Poisonous and polarizing, because that is what that echo chamber is. Fueling paranoia, hatred and suspicion, not just of politicians, um, but of scientists, uh, of experts of all sorts, just go out there and there it all is, swirling around. And we as followers of Jesus Christ and the church, both as individuals and as a church, cannot set ourselves apart from this. We must surely step up to our responsibility and to be part of the change. And that requires from us not just advocacy, important though that is, we need to be advocates, each of us, for change, but it also requires action. Now I've seen in my life and what I'm in my eighth decade now, incredible though that seems, <laughs> uh, I have seen uh, in, in my life as a lawyer, as a legislator and a diplomat, but always, always, always in all those things as an activist, that real change, systemic and sustainable change comes about only when that change comes, not simply as a result of what happens uh, on the barricades or at the end of the barrel of a gun, or by a cross on a ballot paper. All those things happen 
all those things have had their role to play in human history. But sustainable systemic change only comes about and only endures when it is accompanied by a change in the hearts of men and women. By a change in the hearts of men and women whom transforming their self, themselves, their attitudes one to the other, their relationships one to another as children of God. It is those relationships, the change that comes about in them through changes of heart, that change institutions and countries and the world. And this is the lesson for me of uh, the Mahatma and the movement uh, for colonial freedom in India, of such a regard, of, 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 of soul force. This is the message of, of the civil rights movement and of Martin Luther King. This is the message of Archbishop Romero in uh, Latin America. This is the message of Tambo, Mandela, and Tutu, and Ubuntu in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. We are what we are because of others. We need to open up a space for the power of the spirit <coughs> of love, the power of love, not as a sentiment alone, but as a strategy, as a driver uh, to action, to bring about that uh, change. You know, we, we came together a few years ago in, in uh, 1919 uh, uh, at the Methodist Church uh, in, in Notting Hill. A number of you may, may know it. Uh, we came together, brought together, uh, by uh, David, David Haslam, who a number of you may uh, also know. Uh, David is a great activist, uh, a challenging man in so many ways, and necessary challenge. And he brought us together to commemorate the first gathering of the World Council of Churches program to combat racism that occurred there some 50 years uh, before. An ecumenical effort uh, to mobilize the churches and the people globally uh, against racism in general and apartheid in particular. And I'm here to tell you that The struggle against apartheid, uh, and I was a part of that, a witness uh, to it, the struggle of apartheid would not have achieved what it did achieve had it not been uh, for the power of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you, because I was there, at the moment when, as a result of the work of the World Council, of, of churches and all that, all that flowed from there. I was there and present in the room when Kenneth Kaunda brought together under the auspices of the WCC <coughs> Bears Naude, uh, an Afrikaner uh, Dutch Reformed Church theologian uh, who headed up the South African Council of churches at that time uh, brought together Bears Naude and Oliver Tambo. Uh, the two men had never met. Uh, Oliver Tambo, of course, was banned. Uh, Bear, Bears Naude was under constant surveillance and harassment from the apartheid authorities. We were in Lusaka. Bombs were growing off in Lusaka around the Pomonzi Hotel where this meeting took place in an upper room. 
we heard the bombs going off planted uh, by the Bureau uh, of, uh, of State Security. And these two men fell into each other's arms. They fell into each other's arms and they embraced each other. And at that moment, the African, the black African liberation fighter and the white Afrikaans theologian, when those two men came together in those circumstances, you knew that something was happening. You knew that something was afoot. There was present in that room tangibly the Holy Spirit. And from that meeting, there came the Lusaka Declaration. It's there on the record, which was the first to declare apartheid as a sin. From that movement, there came a new life and a new impetus for the sanctions movement in um, the United States in particular and beyond. And within five years of that meeting, within five years of that meeting, not only had Nelson Mandela been free, but they were free elections for a non-racial parliament in South Africa, in which black maids and white madams stood in line together to cast their first free vote, together or at all, within five years. It did not seem possible but through the power of the Holy Spirit, it came about. Not just in that room, but I think always, whenever I think of that room, I think of a cold, rainy morning of a Thursday in Frankfurt, when every morning a group of white German church women stood outside the consulate general and prayed. That's all they did. Every Thursday, come rain or shine, they stood outside the concert general and they prayed. <coughs> that's all they did, but that's everything. That's everything. That is the power of the Holy Spirit at work. So it's not just at the levels of presidents and general secretaries and leaders. It isn't just in gatherings of the powerful. It is in the hands of all of us, each and every one of us by our actions, individually and collectively, to become agents of the spirit. Movers, shakers, change makers, speaking into and moving the most difficult and intractable of situations. We saw it, didn't we, with the with the Jubilee movement? Do you remember the Jubilee movement? Don't believe for one moment. Uh, that uh, John Major or, or Gordon Brown or Paul Boateng or Tony Blair or any other Prime Minister or Treasury Minister just suddenly woke up and looked in the mirror and said, wouldn't it be nice uh, 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 to uh, free uh, developing uh, nations uh, 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 of debt? Wouldn't it be a good thing if we reverse decades of policy by the IMF and the World Bank and put an end to structural adjustment. It happened because people were prepared and the churches were central to it to ring around meetings of the G7 and the G20. You remember? Exactly, you were there. 
and stuff happens. And that's what we need now. We need a similar response now to the global crisis around access to COVID-19 vaccines, tests and treatment, without which we are ultimately all at risk because eventually another variant will emerge. The recovery such as it is will be set back still further and millions more will die, be thrown into poverty or have their lives irreversibly marred by the impact of contagious disease. So at this conference and in what we take away from this Methodist conference here in Telford, surely we have to reflect the reality that's out there on the ground. Only 18% of people in low income countries have received a first dose. Only 18% have received a first dose. And here we are agonizing over whether or not to have our fourth or whether or not to give a first dose uh, to uh, babes in arms and toddlers. Only 18% of people in low income countries have received a first dose. While we have over 7,000 tests per thousand people here in the UK, this is compared to 56, 56 per thousand people in Cote d'Ivoire. 62 in Gambia and 77 in Ghana. Effective treatment for COVID-19 now is now available. However, uh, <laughs> prices are high. And in Argentina, in Brazil, Iraq, in Lebanon, Malaysia, Thailand, to name just a, just a few, they are unable to buy even the cheaper generic versions due to patent uh, protections. You know, last year, uh, June, uh, the UK took out of COVAC, which is the global uh, consortium, which was designed to promote equitable distribution of vaccines. The UK last June, took more out of COVAC than the whole of Africa put together by way of vaccines, the UK alone. You know, uh, the reality is that even before the vaccines had been given market approval, G7 countries, <coughs> you know, and they're meeting now, had purchased over a third of the total global supply, despite the fact that they account for only 13% of the whole population of the world. Pfizer and uh, Johnson & Johnson didn't deliver a single shot to South Africa between January and March 2021. They only started to make shipments in April, and then they dumped large amounts from July to September, so it simply wasn't possible uh, to get the stuff out to the people. We have, you know, we have to learn the lessons. We have to read the signs of the time. We have to address this issue uh, of global inequity. Because we are seeing the inequity in vaccines now being continued with inequity to uh, access to treatments. High income countries have brought up almost the entire supply of Pfizer's Paxlovid and MSD's uh, Lagevrio for 2020-20 while current voluntary license agreements where pharma companies let certain companies in certain countries uh, produce generic versions, exclude many countries which have established 
uh, manufacturing capacity. So they could, if they had the license, they could make the stuff. But they are quite deliberately excluded, restricting supply even further, with the result, of course, that the profits are even greater. New uh, analysis, which only came out last Saturday, two days ago, shows that the higher income countries have already brought up the majority of Pfizer and Moderna's Omicron specific vaccines, which are due to be put out in autumn. So our voice is needed now. We need to be articulating and requiring that the WTO negotiations, and you know, you had a situation in which India, South Africa, initially backed uh, by the United States, were arguing uh, for a temporary waiver of, of the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights agreements at uh, the WTO. So uh, countries could uh, uh, have a, a greater hope of, of access to COVID-19 medical products and te technologies. But uh, despite uh, these uh, propo proposals, the UK government actively opposed the TRICS waiver. They weren't just neutral about it, they actively opposed it in Geneva, claiming that uh, IP intellectual property was a necessary condition for innovation. But all the leading vaccine uh, developers, without, without exception, have benefited from billions of dollars in public subsidies. Your money, my money. You know, Oxford uh, AstraZeneca was 97.6% funded through your money and charitable money. 97.6% funding. And government says, no, no, we are opposing the uh, capacity uh, of uh, countries which could manufacture vaccines, which could manufacture treatments. We're opposing the waiver agreements. We're opposing the agreements to enable the transfer of expertise and skills. And I'm afraid uh, they have uh, won. That's the bad news, just a, just a matter of weeks ago. They won that battle. Uh, so despite the initial support of the US, uh, despite uh, the practical proposals and technically sound proposals brought forward by India and South Africa on behalf of the, of, of the, global, of the global South, Europe, acting in concert with the UK. Funny, isn't it? <laughs> that when certain vital commercial interests are at stake somehow, not when peace in Northern Ireland is at stake, but when vital commercial interests, somehow they find a commonality of purpose. You know, uh, we need to we need really to reverse that. We need to make, and the proposals are out there, we need to ameliorate the agreement that has been arrived at. We need to see the agreement expanded uh, to uh, include uh, COVID uh, diag diagnostics uh, and uh, the new uh, vaccines. And that's something that cannot happen without concerted action. That's something which conference needs to engage with. And, you know, the good news is, and, and you, can, you, can, you can find the information, you can find the pro forma uh, 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 letters out there to, uh, to, 
to tell us how to do it, to tell us how to how to formulate the re, uh, the uh, the, res, uh, the resolutions. Uh, Missingmedicines.org, uh, globaljustice.org. These are out there doing the business. Stopaids.org, which have now expanded their efforts because we are all in this together. We are what we are because of others. Have expanded their efforts now to include this call of a vaccine justice and equity. We need to put pressure on pharmaceutical companies to share the manufacturing know-how with potential producers around the world and push for this to be included in the World Health Organization's pandemic treaty. And just as the churches and individuals did, and a number of you undoubtedly put, did buy shares. You remember buying shares in BP and Shell and Anglo-American turning up uh, at uh, the AGMs? Well, we're going to have to do the same again with the pharmaceutical companies. We need the power of our church investments to be applied to the pharmaceutical companies so that they do the right thing. We can support the extension of the current WTO decision on trips and COVID to include tests and treatments to enable greater access. Because there was some progress made, not enough, but there was some progress made, but it excluded tests and treatments. Well, let's push to extend the limited progress made at least to tests and treatments. And we also to attach conditions to public funding of pandemic tools to ensure that they are made globally accessible. So if it is our money, 97.6% of our money going into the development of these vaccines, we need to make sure that they are globally available. And so that is once again about writing and lobbying MPs, it is about passing resolutions, it is about using shareholder power, it is about using the power of prayer, it is about creating space for the Holy Spirit to enter in to our world and to our work. Global Britain needs to be signed up to and leading an ethical response to challenges to all these challenges. And Methodism needs to step up and to step out as John and Charles Wesley did all those years ago when they took on the powers and the principalities in Britain and in the Americas to oppose the abominable trade in human beings. When they took to the pulpit, to the streets, to mobilize uh, public sentiment so that it became a strategy to defeat the slavers and the slave, and sla and the slave trade, which was the foundation of this country's wealth. So the challenge for us is to, ste is to step up and to step out so that our government, our companies, our financial institutions themselves step up to the plate and deliver on the commitments already made and mobilize around global action to put together the policy responses so urgently needed. If our multilateral institutions reformed, reinvigorated and resourced are able to do what it is that they need to do on contagion, climate change, and conflict. But that requires each of us, each and every one of us, our churches, to take ownership and agency of these issues, inspired by his love, the love of the risen Christ, love in action, not as sentiment alone, but a strategy. We are what we are because of others. We are what we are because of others. Ubuntu. And I would add to that another Khosa word I learned during my time 
in South Africa. And it's this. Vuku Zen Zeli. Take one thing away apart from Ubuntu today. Please take that word away. Look it up. Google it. Vuku Zen Zeli. V U K U Z E N Z E L E. Vuku Zen Zeli. Which means. Let's get up ourselves, each and every one of us. Get up yourself and go for it. Get up yourself and go for it. Vu ku zen zen. Vu ku zen zen. Let's get up ourselves and go for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, well, I don't know where to start. There's so much in there that uh, I want to keep making sure I remember. Not least, the love of Christ as strategy. <laughs> well, it's a great strap line for the Methodist Church. The love of Christ as strategy. We've missed the chance to have notice of motion now, and we? we'll have to wait till next year for that one. But thank you so much indeed. We're going to uh, open up the floor to questions now and uh, my beautiful assistant Steve is uh, is going to wander around with the with the mic uh, we have got some questions from online as well so we'll feed those in um, so just to start with we've got um, we've got uh, a question just behind you Steve and hopefully we're working here yes Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Paul. I, I, that was excellent. Lovely to hear. Um, very encouraging and um, you know, delighted to hear it. Um, and it certainly feels for me something that encourages me. I wonder how you react to what we have heard this morning at a conference that we're very tired. We haven't got much money now. Um, but before we take any action, before we put any notice of motion out, we must think very carefully about the implications on the church, on the people of the church who are very tired and have got too much work to do. Um, and that every time we ask somebody to do something, we've got to pay for it. I just wonder what your reaction was to that. I mean, if I haven't characterized it properly, um, then my apologies, but I think that's roughly what was said to us this morning. You know, I was talking to the sister earlier on, and we shared with each other, didn't we, a sense sometimes that, <laughs> she knows who she is, that the obstacles just fell. You know, she'd been doing mission in a very, very difficult place, a place that I knew and an organization I'd been at on the board of also done some work. Very difficult place in very difficult circumstances. And we came to the conclusion together that what you have to do is to do what you can do. Do what you can do. Do it with passion. Be focused, be clear on your intent. Do what you can do with all those things. But put it at the foot of the cross. Put it at the foot of the cross. He died for us. He died for us. 
He died that we might overcome all that stuff. All that stuff that's out there. And we all face it, don't we, in different ways, in every aspect of our life. There's so much stuff. But we have to believe. And we have the proof of it. <clears throat> that when we, when we act with passion, with love, with focus and with intent, we put it to his feet. That stuff goes away and things happen. But we have to do what we can, when we can, and as much as we can of it. And put the rest at his feet. That's my response to you. And, you know, I say that as a, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I I believe in uh, I believe in KPIs. Uh, I believe in measuring impact. I believe in the most effective use of resources. I believe in all those things. None of them are inconsistent with passion, love, focus, mm -hmm. intent, and putting it, putting it at his feet. So we've got a question um, from people that have been joining us online, and this comes from Steve Summers. And he says, Paul, I fondly remember my first encounter with you as you led a seminar at the Greenbelt Festival about racism and the church's response following the riots in the early 1980s. I told you I had an afro. <laughs> well. I've appreciated and respected your wisdom and actions since then. But tackling racism in the UK has been slow and inadequate since. Do you think the church should be doing more and more quickly, for example, through reparations? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, we can't dodge the truth that uh, the abominable trade that slavery is at the very heart of our nation's finances, of our nation's wealth, and in some instances, of the wealth of the church too. And that's an incontrovertible fact. And I do urge you, anyone who doubts that for one moment uh, to and you can do it online which is one of the great i mean there's lots of you know, downsides to the online experience but you can do this online uh, go to the bank of england museum's website and just look and be led round their uh, exhibit on slavery and the bank of england it's a wonderful piece of work that came about as a result of the activism of the Black and Minority Ethnic Network within the Bank of England and the good sense of its uh, governing body. Uh, and it shows very, very clearly the links uh, between this country's economic wealth uh, and uh, the slave trade. It shows very clearly how the slavers were the beneficiaries of abolition and the enslaved and, and were, were made to pay for it and went on paying for it. And if you read uh, the speeches of the prime minister of uh, Barbados, Mia Motley, uh, again, you know, easily accessible, she will share with you exactly how they have been paying for it ever since. Now, we just can't ignore that. We can't ignore, and the Church of England must not ignore, 
the result of the work that it has done on Queen Anne's bounty. A forensic examination of the accounts that demonstrate very clearly the economic and material benefits and that the Church of England has been living on ever since. So we have to address that issue. And it cannot be addressed without addressing seriously the issue of reparation, of recompense, of remedial action that will involve uh, the identification and the transfer of practical resource. It is not an issue that we can continue to put in the all too difficult box. So I don't pretend it's easy, it's not easy. It is difficult, it is complex, but I think it has to be done. And I think the time has come to do it. Thank you. Just going to take another question from online, and this one's from John Cooper. And John asks, the church often self-censors and suggests its voice isn't listened to by those in power. From your experience, who listens when we speak up? Uh, from my experience, uh, you know, um, how do I put this? First of all, I think it's important to understand and to accept that, you know, politics doesn't exist in, in a vacuum. You know, uh, politics is, is of its very nature uh, focused for success on taking and obtaining a sense of what is around and what's going on around. Um, politicians feed on that. That is the nature. That is our nature. That is the nature of the beast. That's what we do as politicians. We feed on what is around. And we seek uh, to respond to that. And therefore, you know, it, it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's a fallacy to believe that what we say and do as individuals or what we say and do as churches, institutions, uh, is somehow, you know, it's all a waste of time, it's all a waste of, uh, of effort because nobody listens. Actually, no. Um, they will come to listen. First of all, make sure they hear, because there's a difference. If there's a difference between hearing and listening. You've got to hear first, then you listen. So we've got to make some noise and politicians respond to that. That is what we do. Uh, and therefore you've got to begin by making noise. And if you make enough noise, and also if what you say is informed and is rooted in truth, you find, I've found over time, that it comes from that listening. And let me just give you an example, because I, you know, it's, this is not sort of, um, I am share with you uh, this practical example. When I was an article clerk, I was approached by a group of black women living in Lewisham to come to a meeting in Lewisham, which they wanted to hold about the sus laws, about the Vagrancy Act. These were just a group of black mums in Lewisham, whose sons, like so many other black boys, were being picked up by the police and charged under the Vagrancy Act. Uh, being a, a, a suspicious person, believed to be likely to commit an arrestable offence. That was enough 
you could be convicted, you get a criminal conviction on that grounds alone, that a police officer, a couple of police officers were suspicious and believed that you were about to commit an arrestable offence. Now, that was a law introduced in, what, 1834, in the, 18, in, in, in the immediate aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. Almost immediately it was introduced, there were campaigns to get rid of it. Uh, almost immediately. None of them got anywhere. But in the 1970s, this group of women came together in Lewisham. They started a campaign. Now, uh, it was a smaller room than this with no more than a dozen women in it. I know because I was with them. I was an article clerk and they wanted some legal advice. I became their legal advisor. These women founded and led a campaign that ultimately won the support of the trade unions, of the CBI, of the churches, uh, of a wide cross-section of organizations supporting something that had been started by this group of women. The then Labour Home Secretary, Merlin Rees, would have absolutely nothing to do with the campaign, opposed it tooth and nail. Now, there were some Labour MPs who supported it. There were some Lib Liberal MPs who supported it. And, and this is the important thing, after the defeat of the Labour government and the election of Margaret Thatcher, a man called Sir John Wheeler became chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee. He was a probation officer and a former prison governor. And Sir John Wheeler just had this sense that something was wrong. Something was wrong. And there was this campaign that was growing all over the country. And those women came, and I saw this in my own eyes because I was with them. I had never been to Parliament before, never been there. I had been a member of the Labour Party since I was 15, but I'd never been into Parliament. You know, I was an activist and a lawyer. I was busy trying to get qualified and being an activist. I demonstrated outside Parliament on many occasions. I'd never been in. It didn't seem much point, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there was a point to go in and to support these women and to give evidence, and then we gave evidence. And Sir John Wheeler's committee recommended an all party committee led by a Conservative recommended that Section 4 be abolished and a Conservative government abolished it. What does that tell you? It tells you that activism, informed activism, fueled by passion and justice, authentically rooted in the experience of communities, can prevail. And so never let anyone tell you that it's a waste of time. It isn't. It is possible to make a difference. That's my response. Well, a fair few hands up in uh, the room. So um, perhaps if we could go to my groups of three. Yeah, if we, okay, if we, we have three. I think if we take James at the back and then Ian had hand up and we'll come to you as well and take those three. Thank you. Um, hey, he, 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 um, you mentioned that we need to um, gather and raise our voice and all that a lot, but with the, but with the recent impact, I can I cannot really be responsible. I'm going to call it the police human rights. Uh, not, yeah, he, 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 the police rights and protest, but I don't know why it's officially called. Um, how can we do that when our when we when he, when I like to gather and when I like to gather and make noise and have been prohibited by the government. Yeah. 
Thank you, Paul, for mentioning our role to create that safe space in which to have the conversation and to open up spaces. Are you referring, therefore, to our role as church to be a convener of those conversations? Um, and to what extent would you advise us that that is a role that we should take? I, um, you talked a lot and very helpfully around kind of COVID and you, on several occasions you mentioned Ukraine, which obviously the Ukraine mm. crisis has been a big driver of inflation, food insecurity and so forth. And um, a question I had is kind of, to your mind, what's a Christian response to the Ukraine crisis? Because I think there is a challenge, which is to a certain extent, economic sanctions are kind of the way we would like to go, but we've seen the consequences of those mm. economic sanctions. Um, both um, in this country and around the world, and I suppose, what are the things that we can ask our government for um, in that in that context? Let me respond in, in this way. Uh, you know, the House of Lords acted as a check on uh, the government's uh, aspirations with their proposals in relation to policing and demonstrations. And some of the worst aspects uh, have been taken out uh, of uh, the legislation. It remains um, a thoroughly unpleasant and in my view unnecessary uh, piece of legislation that doesn't in fact make the job of the police any easier and indeed was opposed by uh, a lot of police officers in fact making their job more difficult. Um, it, we are where we are with it. Uh, it's still possible, and you know we need to recognize this, it's still possible to demonstrate. Uh, it's still possible uh, to make uh, our voices uh, heard. Uh, it's still uh, possible uh, to do many things which still unfortunately in many countries in the world it is not possible to do and so one of the things we have to do is to use uh, the law uh, to do just that uh, and to present the alternatives uh, and to challenge and to protest and we have also uh, to um, hold those who have brought uh, the law to the statute book to account uh, and to seek uh, wherever possible uh, to ensure that it is applied fairly and properly and to use the judicial process to that, to that end. You know, I believe very much uh, in uh, the law uh, as an instrument of social, of social change. Uh, and they're good examples of it being of it being just that. And we need to equip ourselves in order to do just that. Uh, but we need to recognize that lawful dissent yeah, is absolutely a critical part of any fully functioning democracy. And if we are to defeat uh, Putin, and if we are to defeat the authoritarian tendencies in this world that go beyond Putin and that exist uh, uh, gl globally, uh, then we need to uphold in our own uh, public uh, life and in our own political activity, uh, the rule of law, respect for the rule of, lo uh, of law uh, and a willingness to use the law in order to enhance uh, the rights of others uh, and protect our own rights and we need to oppose any attempt to tinker around with the European Convention on Human Rights so as to limit uh, our access, uh, our full access uh, to uh, the courts at every le level, uh, domestic and supernatural. And that will be the next big fight. And, you know, the church has to be there. And it is about lobbying, it is about letter writing, it is about, it is about protesting, and that we have to do. And we do have 
of the capacity to create safe space. Uh, and you know, and let me just think of, of one person that used to do that, uh, Vic Watson in Clubland. Uh, Vic Watson in, in, uh, 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 in North Paddington. Uh, you know, always uh, Vic made sure that the, the club land off Fernhead Road, where he was before, there were places. I remember the first time I met Vic uh, was at a meeting in Fernhead Road uh, that was protesting and organizing against something called Winkley. That's a, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's forgotten by many now, but Winkling was the way in which landlords in, in, in upwardly uh, up and coming areas used to winkle out protected tenants by harassment and intimidation. So they could sell off the, the properties or to rent them out at a, high, at a higher, higher rent. And Vic, <laughs> used Fernhead Road. That's how I came to that as a young lawyer on you on the block, literally, uh, went along to this meeting in Fernhead Road, in the church, about tenants' rights. And uh, in 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 Clubland. Clubland was right next door to Carter Street Police Station, which is one of the most notorious police stations in South in South London, where people were routinely beaten up. And on occasion, Vic would go with the congregation outside uh, Carter Street and people would start singing hymns and pray. <laughs> That's actually quite challenging. You know, I think some of those people who were doing some other bad things in Carter Street were challenged by it. Uh, <laughs> that, that, it seems to me, you know, we have to be we have to be prepared uh, to do. Uh, and uh, we have uh, to answer uh, your, to answer your, your question. I think, you know, we have to make the most uh, of the opportunities that do exist to present alternatives. We have to utilize institutions uh, where we are present uh, to, to demonstrate that things can be done in a different way. And, and that does mean turning up. You know, it means, uh, it means innovation. It means uh, being prepared to take risks. Uh, it means engaging in the debate and being prepared sometimes to be a lone, a lone voice. All those things you have to do, it seems to me, to make, to make the difference that we, that we seek. Does that, does that help? Yeah. I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to bring this evening to an end. We've run out of time. <laughs> um, but sorry if you have questions. Uh, we, we're going to have to finish now. But I'm sure you'd all like to uh, thank Paul again for an evening where we have been challenged, we've been inspired, and I'm sure we are all going from here to step up and step out in the name of Christ and with the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, Paul. Hey. Thank <laughs> you.